Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast with your host, Andrew Keel. This is the podcast where you can get the education you need to invest 100% passively in the highly profitable niche of mobile home parks. Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. This is your host, Andrew Keel. And today we have an amazing guest in mobile home park broker, Chris Wessel, Senior Vice President at NAI Martins. Before we dive in, I want to ask you a real quick favor. Would you mind please taking 30 seconds to head over to iTunes and rate this podcast with five stars? This helps us get more listeners, and it means the absolute world to me. Thanks for making my day with that five-star review of the show. All right, let's dive in. Chris has 20 years of commercial real estate experience with a particular emphasis in manufactured housing communities. Chris has been associated with mobile home park transactions dating back to 2008 and has cultivated a focused list of more than 1,500 active buyers for the mobile home park property type throughout the Midwest and Southeast where he focuses. In today's episode, we will discuss where the mobile home park sales market is and you know what's changed in 2023. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andrew, for having me on. Really good to get together for a little bit. Yeah, no, totally. Chris, would you mind starting out by telling us a little about your story and how in the world you got into the manufactured housing community brokerage business? Sure. Yeah, I, I always joke that everybody gets in the business either by accident or, or by being born into it. And uh, I got here by accident. Uh, it was a prospecting accident. So I was doing general brokerage right out of college, and one of our early assignments was to find a mobile home community to purchase for a gentleman who had a, a bunch of single-family rentals, and, and that was going to be his next step. And that project ultimately was not successful, but born out of that was, was a good career. I ended up putting together a you know a database at that time of about 60 mobile home communities, and I, and I called every single one of them and, and asked them if they wanted to sell. And I think we got three that said maybe. And one of those was was too large for him to purchase, so we we turned that into a listing, and that closed in January of 2008. And it was by far the largest deal I had sold at the time. And what I noticed was that uh, when we started advertising the property, that the phone really rang, and so there there was an audience for these things. I think it took a couple years to do the second one, <laughs> and then fortunately after that, the the, the tap turned on, and and uh, we've been able to really run with this now. That's fantastic. Wow. Would you mind sharing a little bit about 2008 and kind of what that looked like? I mean, I know you were you were newer into this side of the business, but you know, obviously we think about the great recession and and the housing crisis. What did 2008 look like from a mobile home park standpoint? So, I was still pretty new into the business at that time and you know, we'd done that transaction, we were searching for our second one. And at that time, I still had you know feet on both sides of the fence, so I was doing some general brokerage work. But um, you know, across commercial real estate at that time, it was a pretty pretty hard stop, and and I don't think it's looked the same as any other downturn before that or, or since then. And and really, even the, some of the you know headwinds we have in the economy currently, uh, you know, it's nothing like it was then. So yeah, it was a really really big decrease in transaction volume. And, um, you know, a lot of, you know, kind of paralysis in the economy and, uh, things, things certainly feel different, uh, than then. And, and, you know, we're probably all thankful for that. Oh, totally. Totally. And then, you know, what did 2008 to like 2011 look like, you know, were you, were transactions, you know, plentiful, you know, were they really all 10 caps and, you know, there was distressed deals everywhere or was it kind of hit and miss? The demand for mobile home communities since that very first one has has really been unabated and and really has grown. So I would say, other than you know we had some financing woes back then, it's kind of been a crescendo of in terms of demand for communities and pricing almost ever since then. And uh, you know, and I, I think we really I I started to kind of hit my stride on the community business probably about 2013. And yeah, at that time, it was an excellent time to, to be a purchaser. I think anybody that was lucky enough to get in that early is glad they did. But at, at that time, the formula was, you know, we were listing communities, you know, almost always with a mom and pop owner. 
and, you know, occupancy between two thirds and 80%. And we would list them on a 10 cap and they would sell on an 11 cap. And, <laughs> and, you know, on those deals, if we got 10,000 of space, we got a pat on the back and everybody was very happy. And, wow. you know, so we compare that to, you know, modern times and uh, you, you could see why the ones, the ones that started there earlier are glad they did. <laughs> oh, I bet. Yeah. That would be fantastic. If we could just get a couple of those deals. Um, yeah. Where where are we today in 2023? Uh, it's you know, we're recording this in October. Uh, you know how do transaction volumes compare to the last few years? So 2023, in terms of transaction volume, almost has to certainly has to be a, a step down from from where we were. And I think that's mainly because I think particularly in the first half of this year, there was a lot of reprogramming going on. And so there were deals that fell out of contract. There were there were deals that got put together on the wrong assumptions and ultimately did not close. And and just a really a lot of recalibration is is what I've heard from you know other market participants and, and really our own experience too. Our pipeline now I, I think is about as strong as I ever remember it being. You know, so we we've got stuff that's uh, you know in line soon for closing and and things in LOI stage and, and a lot in listing stage. So I, I think if if your only measurement is is transaction volume, you know the you know the, the news is good. The market I think is um, <laughs> you know this job is never boring. So uh, you know you look at how things have changed in different directions just since the start of COVID. You know we we've kind of ping ponged all over the place since then on what's been going on. I think the you know the interest rate increases have stressed pricing probably most so for the what i call kind of the main street assets you know so if you've got 50 spaces and maybe it's a smaller metro and a little bit of hair on that deal you know your buyer audience for that probably is um, you know smaller investors that rely on commercial bank debt and for a lot of those deals to trade they're 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 going to be a, a function of the available financing so that cap rate can be nine something right now on the other end of the spectrum i think the primo stuff, you know, the high percentage of tenant owned, large properties, institutional quality, strong market, those deals have marched along at, at, at pricing that's maybe much stronger than any of us anticipated. And, you know, we've seen cash purchases, we've seen low leverage or, or 1031 buyers that are, are still making some of those deals trade, you know, at cap rates below, you know, what the debt would be. And, you know, how much longer that goes on, you know, I don't know where we go from here, but it probably depends on, you know, whether rates linger or move up or move down. And and if you ask three different people, I think you get three different answers right now. Wow. So we're, you're still seeing things trade at below interest rate debt, you know, and, and those type of assets are probably getting six and a quarter, you know, at this point, right? So those institutional quality yeah. mobile home communities are you know, you know, trading at what, four to five caps. So far that can still happen. Mm -hmm. And, and some of our, our priciest examples have been maybe agreed to for a little while and still kind of working through the deal process. But yeah, I think we've got on the low side, we've got a couple and, you know, three and four cap transactions that, that could potentially come together right now, but we've got stuff clear to the nines. And, and again, just across the spectrum of, of quality and location. Yep. Yep, quality and location right. are key. So, you know, is it a good time to sell? Certainly the the better time was 12, 12 months ago or 18 <laughs> months ago, right? I, you know, I think there there's some sellers that, that come to market and they have a reason. And I think now is, is more a time where we're going to see the transactions that occur with sellers that, that have a reason. And, you know, the ones that, is, you know, it's a pure profit motivation and there's no no time constraints. I, I think some of those folks might sit this out for a little while longer. But, you know, we've had folks come to market for other reasons. It might be just, you know, wanting to change in lifestyle or a retirement. You know, we've seen some listings that have come about because of, you know, I, I call it pruning the trees. You know, if they have a, a property that's a geographic outlier or one of them that really doesn't fit their core competencies of, of you know, how they operate communities and where they like them to be located or or is it, you know, like I said, geographically, do they just not have much scale in that area? And so we're seeing those kinds of sellers. I think for sellers that, that do want to maximize pricing, if they're in a position to seller finance and, and wait a little while on the rest of that money to come in, I think that's an attractive way to, 
to get things done right now and, and maybe make it work for both parties. I think how common is are, that? How common is that with the seller financing component? And, and what does that look like, you know, in real time? Like, what are you seeing that look like in transactions you're working on? I think it has been uh, conspicuously absent in some of our transactions, but talking to other market participants, I think that's becoming more, you know, more common than it was. And I just think that's a function of the set of sellers that we have on the market at this current juncture and what, what makes sense for them, what they can and can't do. But, you know, in, in the, the market that we were in, seller financing was a tough conversation, you know, because the, the lenders Why? would lend the money so, yeah, exactly. It, it, the money was so inexpensive that if, if our opening call with a buyer was asking about seller financing, then there's a pretty good chance they weren't qualified to buy. Yeah. And now it's completely different. You know, I think there's a reason to do it. The buyers, are, I think, are still giving. I think they're still uh, aggressive and, um, you know, but most of them have the same problem and that's debt pricing. And if you as a seller can solve that problem, then, you know, I think they're happy to adjust the the purchase price um, as, as long as they can, you know, get the debt they're looking for. Totally. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And yeah, we started, we have a couple of communities we're selling right now and we've received offers on them, you know, asking for like a seller mm-hmm. hold, seller held second uh, note. Have you seen any of those, you know, uh, type of offers or any deals get done, you know, with like a seller holding the second note? Yeah, yeah. I um, mezzanine seller financing has is, is, is always been a favorite <laughs> trick of mine. We actually utilize that uh, even in uh, in the in the prior prior market conditions, and sometimes that was the way to bridge a buyer and a seller together that were maybe just a little ways apart on price, and you know, from the seller's mindset. You know, maybe they got that, you know, last little percentage of money that we wouldn't have seen otherwise and went to them and said, hey, you know, I can get you that last 150. You just have to wait on it. And sometimes the answer was yes. Yeah, we'll do that. And, um, you know, and we're one one nice thing about this property type is you usually have more than one type of collateral. You know, so you've got the the land that that gets collateralized by the lender or the, the commercial bank or, or agency or whoever's financing it. And then you've got the homes that, uh, you know, may not be encumbered by that process that that can be secured, you know, be security for a different loan. That's an important differential there because a lot of primary, you know, primary, you know, first mortgage holder lenders won't allow a second mortgage on the real estate, right? Mm -hmm. But if you split them up, this, you know, the, the, the bank will have the real estate loan, right? They'll have the first position there. And then, you know, the seller can use the homes as collateral, right? Like keep the titles Mm -hmm. and, you know, either keep the titles or have liens on them, you know, and uh, do it that way, which we've done a deal that way. So yeah, gives them collateral. We we have also. Very cool. So how have cap rates changed, you know, on, on just kind of like typical Midwest, you know, three-star park, say it's 70 lots in Wichita, you know, 75% 75% occupied on public utilities. You know, what what is it what is that trade for? The community you're describing, that's probably somewhere in the eight percent right now, depending on all the inputs. Um eight percent on actuals. Is, uh, yeah, I think so. Eight eight something. I'm not saying it's eight eight even, but you know, if if you're below a nine percent cap rate on, on something like that, it's probably because there is some rate growth, there is some some infill potential on the on the vacant sites. You know, if you're dealing with something that's very much maxed out, you know, market rent and high, high occupancy, that you know, then you're, you're going to be debt. Con- yeah, I call it debt constrained. You know, so if the interest rate yeah. is seven uh, or seven, I guess it would be higher than that right now. If the interest rate is seven and a half, then uh, maybe that cap rate has to be nine. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, yeah, and I guess like w- where are like typical operators, like your buyers? you know, underwriting these today, you know, are they, is it that eight to eight and a half cap rate on that type of a, you know, community, uh, you know, or where is the, you know, like price per lot or, or, or what's the typical kind of gauge of, you know, what a yeah. deal pencils out to underwriting wise? I think you'll have a lot of things that, that cap in the, the mid eight to nine right now, if it's a property that's, like I said, fairly debt constrained, but, you know, it's, as you know, there's, there's so many varieties of, of quality, location, 
and mm-hmm. and and other things that it's I, you know people ask me what a what are cap rates on mobile home communities I say what what does a car cost <laughs> you know <laughs> there's so many variables but uh, but yeah I think there's a, there's a lot that probably settle in that range today of that that eight and a half to nine and you know it can be more it can be a lot less for the right quality but there, there's going to be a lot of things that probably probably trade or could trade in that range. Yeah, that three star park, you know, over 50 lots, but not over 100, right? Like not institutional quality, mm-hmm. but kind of somewhere mm-hmm. in the middle. Okay, that's uh, that's good insight. And then what type of debt have you seen, you know, operators get on on that type of a property as well, currently? Yeah, I think commercial bank debt, you know, at this moment, I'm guessing you're probably seven and a half, seven, three quarters on, you know, it, it is about as good as anybody's going to see right now. You know, and you can certainly get quotes well into the eights or even nine, depending on uh, which you know which lender you're talking to and and how aggressive or conservative they are. If you can find the you know the thirty year amortization uh, or twenty five, that that certainly helps get deals together. But I, yeah, I think that's how it's going to price on you know at least for commercial bank debt. That's what we're seeing. Yeah, I would say like seven and a half percent interest rate. And then, you know, we're trying to pencil deals out where they kind of like stabilize, right? Like end of end of year two around a nine cap or more. And that's kind of how mm-hmm. we're able to, to do deals. But my, how that has changed, right? The, the days of, uh, yeah. you know, 4% interest rates and being able to pay for a, you know, seven cap, uh, things changed pretty quick there, didn't they? They really have. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, the, the, it hasn't been... Hasn't been boring over the last four years, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. What are your mobile home park buyers like afraid of right now? What type of properties are not trading or are harder to you know to get to sale, uh, and and why? I think it's you know probably nothing that would surprise you. I, I think like any time the market, the the more the more of the measurements of desirability that are in the right place, the easier it is to trade the property. And as you have, you know, more strikes against it, then it does get, you know, more difficult. And 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 I think now is a is a difficult juncture, but we're we're finding buyers and we're working through those challenges and and making it happen. But I think you're always kind of looking at, uh, you know, some of the same attributes. You know, what's the size of the deal? What's the quality of the market? You know, what what's the the park owned home burden? And, you know, the, the more of those that land towards the, the desirable end, the easier it is to get done. But again, we're, for the most part, we're still finding a home for, for most properties. I, I think the only things I can think of that we're in danger of missing on is just maybe where we have a seller that, that can't come all the way to today's, you know, market value on that particular asset and certainly understand those decisions you know it's 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 their property and they you know they have to live with these outcomes a lot longer than we do you know we're mm-hmm. we're, we're typically done uh, you know mostly done at closing plus a little bit of you know plus closing follow-up and clean up and making sure everybody lands in a good place but you know i i, I get it you know if it doesn't work it's not the right business decision then 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 don't do it but we've we, we've had i've been pleasantly surprised with the the amount of product that we we have you know have had coming to market and um and maybe just you know right place right time and we we've taken care of business throughout the different cycles and and so hopefully that's that's helping us a little bit that's great would you mind summarizing like like the hair right there's always like you know this deal is nice but it has this hair on this deal and <laughs> you know some some ideas that like come to mind are like private utilities right like a a lagoon or a wastewater treatment plan. I know a lot of buyers, you know, it's less desirable. Uh, the size, right? Like under what size would you say? Like, you know, for us, we don't look at anything under 50 lots, but I, I'd wonder like what, you know, what size cutoff you're seeing, market size, you know, park-owned homes, older homes, obviously all add hair to deals, right? Gravel roads, you know, no off-street parking. So what what other kind of hair uh, makes a park less desirable, you know, on the deals you're seeing, yeah, I think you hit on on some of the the common themes. The uh, you know private utility systems. There's there's some buyers that that just don't have that it worked into their risk profile, and, and that's just not something they want to take on. You know, or if they've had a bad experience, you know, previously with with private systems, um, then it is very hard to get them to revisit that again. I think if you've got a if you've got a tough market, you know, like if if it's maybe 
you know, the, the pricing and the rents are just a little too affordable in that area or the, the economy is just a little bit too soft. That's certainly something that, you know, it can be challenging to overcome. Um, you know, and then, you know, how much deferred maintenance does the property have? What kind of condition are the utility systems in? Um, you know, you hit on it. I've, I've had, you know, we've had some deals we looked at where maybe the income was in pretty good order today. But as you look at the condition of those homes, there's there's some big question marks on how many of those are still going to be serviceable in five years or 10 years. That can that can really prove a challenge if it's, a, yeah. you know, if the buyer's worried about having to repopulate the community with homes. Totally. Um, but. Totally. And and how many of your buyers would you say are like big institutional buyers, you know, funds and private equity groups? And how many are like the, the smaller kind of, you know, uh, just smaller investors, you know? Ours really run pretty much the circuit and, and it depends on what kind of community we're selling. And so, you know, we, we've been involved in some, you know, smaller projects and smaller markets and and try to take care of you know good care of that business when it comes in and and some of that's repeat clients that need help with with you know maybe properties they purchased earlier in their career before they scaled and then you know all the way to you know we, we've marketed some some very high quality portfolios and and yeah so so i mean we we cultivate those uh, you know those top 100 operators and, and try to keep them you know close to us and and know who to contact to to get deals done but you know, we have a lot of folks that are in kind of that small to medium sized funds and we even have some individual investors that, you know, it might be, you know, just their their money as a side project or or it's family money that uh that they invest. And so yeah, it it runs the circuit and it's you know, we're we're, we're pretty equal opportunity. We'll work on about anything if it's manufactured housing and and I always say we'll uh we'll go wherever we're invited. There and you go. so <laughs> there's there's a there's a buyer for each deal and that that's part of really like being able to to make that match, you know, you 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 don't have to do anything disingenuous to get somebody to buy something. You just have to know how to find the person that wants it. The right person, hundred percent. Have you seen any mobile home park buyers like using variable rate debt the last few years? Do you think there's any like distressed mobile home park owners out there with with restricting debt? You know, similar to the multifamily space. Um, I think there's certainly a risk of that coming about. I don't think we're seeing many of those waves hit the beach so far, but, you know, I, I think every owner that, that's accumulated property in the last few years is, is, is probably looking at their, their, you know, when their loans come up and for adjustment or renewal and, and, you know, checking where they are on financials on those properties. And, and I think some of that planning ahead could be driving, you know, some of the sale decisions we've seen, you know, if there's a, if there's a property they have a lot of equity in, you know, even after a little bit of, you know, coming off the top of, of market conditions, you know, if they can sell that and, you know, that, that money, you know, produces great returns that may average out, um, you know, a property where, you know, the, the payment adjusts and, and the, maybe the return is, is below expectations. So, so I don't think we're seeing a lot of distress or, or anything bloody from that, you know, currently. But um, depending on, you know, where rates go from here and, and if they linger in this zone or higher, you know, it, we, we could see some of that happen. But I, I think it's still a little bit early. And, you know, if, if you've got somebody that's, that's got a portfolio and maybe one or two of those properties are, are coming up this year and the others, you know, are further out, then, then you know, things probably balance themselves out. Yeah. What do you think's coming? You know, the next 12 to 24 months, you know, I was just at a, a real estate conference with a bunch of commercial real estate guys and everybody is like talking about this generational buying opportunity, you know, is, is that so in, in the mobile home space, the mobile home community space, do you think that there are, you know, operators that, you know, took, you know, weird mes debt or, you know, other, you know, debt facilities that, you know, could get them in trouble mm -hmm. make us, you know, create you know, distressed uh, sellers. I I think if your your eyes are open and you're participating in the market, there's there's buy opportunities in, in almost every part of the market. And I, I think one thing you can say for right now is is you know if it works today and and we do get any kind of break in interest rates coming up, you know you're you're going to win twice. You know, so so if the deal makes sense today when you know when your your interest rate is seven and a half or higher. Um, you know, if we get into a period of lower interest rates during that hold period and you can refinance or sell, 
that project's going to exceed, probably exceed what returns you could promise today, sitting here modeling it, not being able to promise a six cap exit, you know, <laughs> may not happen for certain assets. So, so I think there's a, there's a case to, to be out shopped, even if it's just a double or it's, it's trading at par today, there, there, there could be a time in the near future where you're, you're very glad you made that purchase, you know, and then I think we all, you know, anybody that's on the buy side, like you guys, I think you've got to keep your ears open for that. You know where there is some some distress if you start seeing anything come back that's lender owned. But I'll make no prediction on where interest rates go from here because you know who knows. <laughs> but yeah. you know, for we, we've come through a period of several months where all indicators were pointed up only, and I, I think what's interesting right now is I'm I'm hearing mixed predictions. You know, I have some that that tell me, oh, it's going higher, it's going to get worse, it's it's going to be the 70s all over again. And others that say, no, they're about ready to take a break. It's, you know, it's election year. Um, you know, we, we've put a pretty good dent in, in inflation and slowed the economy a little bit. It's going to be fine. And so uh, I guess the good news is that if we're getting mixed signals, then, uh, you know, hopefully it isn't, uh, you know, climbing way higher. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Yeah, I don't have a crystal ball and, and uh, it'd be nice to, you know, but well, let me ask you this, Chris. What would you say is the toughest hurdle for most operators in the mobile home park ownership business? Like, what's the hardest part? Operations. <laughs> not even, not even a question. It is a a business that is really won or lost on operations, and you know that can be the difference. You know, you can take a community in a certain location and a certain quality, and you know the outcomes differ greatly depending on you know how attentive and how successful that operator is, and you know what's their their marketing program for for you know getting homes moved to to new residents, and so I, I think that's it, it, it's not an easy business. You know, I think um, people maybe sometimes underestimate that, and and I, I think that's why we we've seen one reason we've seen so much success with with folks like you that that have figured out the operations side, and you know you've got LP investors that either you know don't have the time commitment it takes to to be an operator themselves or or maybe don't want that risk or don't want those headaches because <laughs> it's, you know, I haven't met, I, I still haven't met that person that says, you know what? I really love operating mobile home communities, <laughs> but, uh, but I think there's a lot of people that have said, you know what? I got good at this and, and, and I like the return profile and, and I like the, the resilience of, of, of this, you know, this type of business. And, and as a passive investor, you know, a limited partner, how could you tell if a general, like a, a general partner, was a good operator or not? Like, what do you have any like ideas or tips? I mean, how how would you tell if you're, you know, looking at a a passive investment? Yeah, yeah, I think you know if I were going to look, I, I think I would visit some of their their existing projects and and actually go see how those look, you know, driving through them and and see how they've executed on those. And, um, you know, and then I think you're, you're really looking at, you know, what's their, what's their track record and what's their experience. And, um, you know, I think, I think who is more important than how much in this case, meaning that if it were me, I, I, I would not just pick the one that promises the best return. I think I would pick the one I was most comfortable with as their, their, you know, their chops as an operator. And, um, you know, cause there's no, you know, if you buy a hundred communities, there's no way all those go perfect. But it, but if you have a good operator, then you know they can they can make the best of of any challenges that might come up on a particular deal. It's so different, right? Like I have some friends that are apartment syndicators, and it's like there's a lot of work on the on the front end, you know, lining the deal up mm -hmm. and and you know passing it off to the property manager. But really, like a lot of the day to day operations fall on that property manager, right? And there's like asset management fees for overseeing the property manager that go to the general partners, but mobile home communities are so different, right? Because there's so many intricacies and you, you can't really just pass these off to a third party because, you know, there's really not good. Uh, I mean, there's some, you know, third party managers that manage nationwide, but from what I've heard and, and from my experience, because we've bought some parks that were managed by them is that it's, it's hard to keep your expense ratios low, you know, through, you know, through third party property management. But I I think it's uh like the, like the little things, right? Like like when a tenant owned home goes up for sale, like our team is all over it. Like we want to broker the sale of that tenant owned home 
to a new person that's going to buy the home and live in the park. And like that little piece right there, if that gets missed, homes are going to start moving out of your communities and your occupancy is going to drop because there's wholesalers and dealers and, you know, they're trying to buy these homes and then, you know, move them out and sell them to somebody else or, you know, the other park up the road that wants to infill. So it's yep. little stuff like that, that make it so much more involved. And that's why I feel the best operators are, are self-managers. What are your thoughts? Yep. I would agree. I, I think the majority of the, the folks we work with, you know, they do, they do self-manage. They do try to develop those, those capabilities in-house. And, um, and, and I think there's a good, good case for doing that. It's, it's an operations intense business. And, um, if you can get good at the hardest part, I, I think that's your best chance to, to create value. And, um, you know, and, and I know like for, for certain situations, you know, third party management may be the way to go for them if, if they don't have that, that team in house. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, yeah, I, I would agree. A lot of operators seem, seem intent on, on, on building that, um, you know, when they can. Yeah, because, you know, and, and when you have scale, you know, when you get over a thousand lots or so, it's it's easier to manage because now you can afford a team to, you know, siphon, siphon off different divisions of the business and manage it more effectively instead of like, you know, one person wearing five different hats. So I think that that, mm-hmm. you know, also plays a role here somewhere. Chris, you know, is there anything else for passive investors, you know, that, that, that they need to look out for when investing into mobile home parks? Like what are the, the top, you know, couple of things you would tell them like, Hey, if I was going to invest in a, you know, passively in a mobile home park deal, this is what I would look for. You know, what, what are those tips? Um, you know, like I said, I, I think the, the very first criteria we covered was, is the operator. Um, I think from there, I, I think it's, it's looking through some of the, the financials and, and do the assumptions make sense? Are they are they reasonable? You know, because ultimately, once you start operating, you, you guys know this. It, it, certain things go better than you thought they would, and certain things are worse. And so, so if they built a pretty, uh, you know, fifty yard line kind of model, and some things go better, some things go worse, then it, you know, the, the project as a whole hopefully goes off, you know, pretty close to to what was projected. And so, yeah, I think kind of checking those assumptions and then looking at the. Location, sorry, sorry know, to pause it? there real quick because like those assumptions, oh. like I think like three pretty important assumptions would be like your rent growth, right? Like, are mm-hmm. you going to raise rents a hundred dollars a month every year for five years? Probably not, right? That's probably on the high end of like expectations right. there, you know. But more like twenty-five to thirty-five dollars per year, you know, after kind of getting to market is, you know, maybe more realistic. Yes. So, you know, I think that's a good, you know, metric to check. Uh, infill, I think is, I mean, I would, I would love your thoughts on infill, but, you know, infilling more than 10 homes a year is probably like really tough, you know, to do, you know, for most operators, there's some that can do it, you know, high level and bring in a lot of new homes. What other top assumptions would you look at? So, yeah. And you mentioned the, the infill. Yeah, if if you're utilizing like a you know full sales model, yeah, it's it's probably pretty tough to to outrun ten homes a year in in most locations. You know, there, there's always somewhere that has has an exceptional demand, but those deals are not every day. If you're if you're embrace, embracing a you know more of a rental model and, and the operator is is wired to do that and, and manage those turnovers, then we have seen some some very strong velocities on on infill with either rental or rent to own programs. But yeah, I, I would look at, like you said, you know, the, the what's the assumption on infill, what's the assumption on on rents, and then um, you know, do you just how do you feel that the the execution matches to that property and that market, and and so some some of those things. Yeah, exit cap rate, right? Which is like kind of guessing right now because we don't know where interest rates are, but you know, it likely will be higher, you know, than, than what you're buying in at. So I think something like that would be another important metric to look at their assumptions. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I, I think if you're, if you're projecting a cap rate on exit, uh, you know, reflective of, of today's conditions. And, and like I said, if, if we do get a break in rates and, and the opportunity is there to refinance or sell, you know, below, you know, at a cap rate below that projection, then, then again, you, you kind of win twice. You win. Yeah, totally. But I mean, I was talking to, to another operator at this conference and he said, you know, we, we bought it, you know, five caps 
And now, you know, these are, you know, seven, eight caps, you know, and this was an apartment mm-hmm. syndicator, but like, you know, yeah. just over the last year, you know, that, that is a huge drop in value just for nothing out of your control, right? It's just the interest rates going up and yeah. cap rates going with it. So that's, that's a big assumption to, uh, to keep track of. Chris, what does the perfect mobile home park investment look like in your eyes and why? Yeah. I think somewhat we would all probably describe the same community, and, and I don't know if we've ever seen that one before. You know, it's it's hard to get, uh, you know, all of those attributes in one place. But I think for me, I would say, you know, somewhere in an area with good demand for housing, I, probably one thing that's interesting about me, I'm more agnostic on size of market than, than probably anybody else you'll meet. You know, and, and the example I always give is I, I grew up in a town of 2,500 people. There's There's one mobile home community in that town. And it was full when I was a child. It was full when I was in high school. It's full today, and nobody's going to build another one. <laughs> and so, yeah. again, if, if there's staying power in that that, that area, then uh, I'm not too worried about. Um, you know, it's it's different if I came to you and said, you know, th- there's a hundred vacancies in this, and you need to fill those. But you know, if you've got a community that's already in stabilized occupancy. We're not really asking you to to dream big or have any vision here. Like the people already live there, you know. Sure. So, um, so but yeah, get, getting back to maybe more of the question, like good demand for housing. You know, rents and home prices uh, in the area. You know, obviously the higher the better, and that just creates a, a bigger you know window of success for manufactured housing if if the site build options are much more expensive. You know, there's a certain threshold where you can justify infill with with new homes that's obviously much much quicker to do and much easier to do than than needing to rely on you know purchasing used homes and having a rehab crew and that kind of thing and there's there's some operators that have made a good business out of doing that but not everybody's got that you know team so um but i i think in terms of uh scale you know certainly i i like things that are 50 or more spaces i think below 50 um, it's it's a different buyer audience, you know, when you on the going outside in terms of, of how qualified they are and and how how they can perform on the deal, and probably from a management and operating efficiencies, you know, fifty that fifty to hundred space zone is a, is a is an area where you still get some attractive cap rates, but you, hopefully you get a you know a decent economies of scale and and certainly good marketability going out. So, but you know we can. You can really take it to the the level of perfection if you want to talk a you know large market, high population growth, high percentage of tenant owned homes. You know, I, I think from my um, you know put my uh, you know taking my broker hat on and, and or just taking my broker hat off and, and trying to put myself in your shoes. I would uh, my favorite deal has always been that that community that's seventy five or eighty percent occupied and and maybe a little below market on rents because you. You really have a couple different places you win there on on you know rent growth and and infill. Yeah, totally. And then public utilities, I think, would be the the other piece, right? Instead of yeah. private, you know, well or septic systems, if you can get city water, city sewer, yeah, that's the trifecta. It is, yeah, yeah. It makes your life easier from a, a regulatory perspective, and um, you know, better risk profile than than, than dealing with the private systems. And, and you know we have operators that'll that'll buy those too. They they just they kind of assign a different, a little bit different cap rate to to account for you know the risk and the headaches. Definitely, Chris. What mistakes have you seen you know operators make? I think we we've seen people that that got into the business and maybe underestimated the operation side, and so we have sold to folks that later came back to us and and you know said hey I did this for a couple of years. And and some of them did okay, you know, like they, but it was, but it was a lot more difficult than they thought, and maybe more time consuming. So I think that's one mistake is is just underestimating the operation side. I always say too, it's a if you're well capitalized, this is a great business. If you're bootstrapping your way in, it is very very tough. And you know the the perfect example being the one you already brought is you know when a when a tenant owned home comes up for sale in your park. And, you know, some operators will choose to buy that home so it doesn't leave and then they can just go resell it to a new resident. And, you know, so you may, you know, maybe that's a used home and you got to come out of pocket with 20000 that month. 
you know, if you're uh, if you've gone into the deal um, on the assumption that your whole retirement income is wrapped up in that, and now suddenly you have no income that month because you bought a home, you know, not a good situation. Now, again, if you, if your access to capital is strong, you may go resell that home for twenty five or twenty nine thousand, and you know, you might get cash or you might carry paper, and so ultimately the return on investment is excellent. But you you got to be able to to live with it the month you buy it. <laughs> Yeah, you got to weather the storm, you know, and that's the hidden CapEx that definitely can sneak up on you. So I, I agree with you on that. Or actually expanding on that point a little bit, you know, I've, I've had, you know, like new individual investors call us and they, they say, hey, I've got a, I've got a hundred thousand or 150,000. I want to buy a mobile loan community. And I tell them, don't, <laughs> you, <know, laughs> yeah. you want to be, a, you want to be an LP investor because <laughs> yeah. uh, just for the examples we gave there, it's a capital intensive business. Definitely is. Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show. If anyone would like to get a hold of you or, or learn more about you, what's the best way for them to do so? So all of our contact information for myself and our other team members is on our website. Uh, it's mhclistings.com, like manufacturing home communities. And uh, so we're on there. Um, email is always good and, and, and you know, we're sure welcome to telephone calls too, but sometimes it's easier to, to schedule those and make sure we're, you know, we're available when you call. Totally. Awesome. And I'll put that in the show notes. Uh, Chris, one, what's one last tip before we sign off for past, passive investors interested in the mobile home park space? Uh, you know, What do you think matters most in a successful mobile home park investment property? I think, again, not, not to repeat, but I think do your, do your diligence on the operator and their track record. And, and if that's strong, I, I think you're going to have the best possible outcomes on, on every other factor. Awesome. Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yep, excellent. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. That's it for today, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Would you like to see Mobile Home Park value add projects in progress? If so, follow us on Instagram at Passive MHP Investing for photos and awesome videos from our recent Mobile Home Park acquisitions. Once again, that's at Passive MHP Investing on Instagram. See you there.